happy Chinese New Year, everybody. The first 20 to 30 minutes or so, Ray and I will go in deep in terms of explaining various facets of Agora, the company, whether it's its origin story, its initial inspiration even, as well as the core technology, the business model, and also some kind of larger commentary as far as China's own enterprise technology scene is concerned. And then we will open this up to questions from the audience. Thanks, Kevin. My name is Ray Ma, and I'm a bilingual bicultural China tech analyst. So I have my own podcast called Tech Buzz China, primarily really focused on consumer internet companies, actually, but do a little bit of enterprise. I consult funds, investors, and companies on all things related to China tech. Really pleased to be here. As for me, my name is Kevin Xu. I am a early stage investor in open source and developer focused companies, which is why I'm interested in companies like Agora. And we'll get into why that is in a little bit. I also write a bilingual newsletter in both English and Chinese called Interconnected. The URL is interconnected.blog. And I think it was two weeks ago, I wrote a article. Uh, called What Does Agora Do? And it minorly blew up a little bit. At least a lot of folks on Twitter have started sharing it as a way to understand this, not so much a new company, but certainly a new, newly publicly traded company, as well as its connection with Clubhouse. We believe that uh, Clubhouse is built on Agora. This is not confirmed by Agora officially. And again, just to uh, add another disclaimer here, neither Ray or I work for Agora. This is just this organic event that we decided to put together since this has been a point of interest for a lot of people. There's no investment advice here. Obviously, do your own research, and then you can make your own money and all that good stuff. So let's get into the meat of the discussion. And I think what's really interesting for Agora is first of all, for those of you who never heard of this company, it is what I will call a platform as a service uh, that's geared specifically for application developers to build apps with real-time audio and or video capabilities like Clubhouse or a lot of live streaming services or platforms that folks might be using already. And the origin story, I think, of Agora is quite interesting. It's founded by Tony Zhao and Tony Wong, so they're two Tonys and they're co-founders of Agora. This company started about seven years ago. And the interesting with Tony Zhao, who is currently the CEO, is that he was one of the founding engineers of WebEx, which is, of course, the video conferencing application that got bought by Cisco later on. And he and Eric Yuan, who founded Zoom, were colleagues. They were both engineers of the original WebEx team. And afterwards, Tony founded another, uh, found I think his first company probably, and that got bought by this live streaming platform in China called YY or YY.com. It is also a publicly listed company in New York. Most of you might have only heard of YY because of the recent Muddy Waters uh, report kind of shorting the company. Might have been the first time you thought about this company. But way back in the days, Tony was YY's CTO. And the interesting about YY is I believe is probably one of the very first live streaming platforms that really reached scale, uh, not just in China, but probably the world. And it already had a lot of these features of interaction, of tipping, of just uh, all kinds of virtual uh, life living, literally, of people who are living their real life online, so to speak. There are all these KOLs and influencers just talking about stuff, live streaming themselves online. And if you are interested in really getting a feel of YY's cultural impact, I recommend you watching this documentary called People's Republic of Desire, which is really interesting and very well done, very polished documentary in term, uh, to talk about YY's cultural impact in China. But what YY also did was because of these online interactions, the, it, it kind of necessitated a lot of technological innovation as well. It is not easy to build a set of technical infrastructure to 
have to be able to handle all this traffic, whether it's the interaction, whether it's the live streaming, to be able to build a network that is ready for those kind of online interactions. So I think that, among other things, really gave Tony Zhao the inspiration to build Agora to be able to solve the kind of problem, the kind of technical problem that he was trying to solve for Hawaii, but for developers, hopefully everywhere around the world, as opposed to just for one company. I'm going to pause that, pause there for a second. So I want to talk about YY for a little bit. It's now rebranded as Joy, still spelled with two Ys, but. It really began as a service for gamers. If you search for the Internet Archives back in 2010 or 11, it was really actually very popular for its audio chat rooms, much like we have on Clubhouse today. Tony Jong was the CTO for a while. He did leave in 2013, but if you again read about the company at its IPO in 2012. Under Tony's watch, it had already achieved some pretty spectacular technical feats. So, for example, it could support eight million concurrent users, which is quite a lot. And in a single channel, it could support a hundred thousand users. In 2011, it had over 400 billion voice minutes, which they, which the company estimated to be bigger than Skype, which, if you remember, was really dominant. So. One of the core themes here that I really personally take away from the story is that maybe when they started, they weren't doing anything super fancy. They were just trying to connect users who were gamers and wanted to interact with each other in real time. But eventually, that really evolved into this much bigger, much more intense industry. This whole live streaming platform, where they saw a need for people to be entertained all over China, and as we know, China has. Hundreds of millions of users, so the sheer number of users and the size of the market meant that YY had to build all this infrastructure from scratch, or else they would not be able to operate. And I think in the process of building that infrastructure is where a lot of the innovations, the innovations required to scale up, is what's making Chinese internet companies actually really interesting these days. That's right, and I think that pattern actually. Uh, exists in the U.S. as well, and it's probably better understood, like because of the sheer size of Google, and they have to necessitate managing their infrastructure resources better. That be, that came with the concept of container, which became Docker, and a bunch of other things. And now our whole cloud infrastructure is really containerized, and we don't even think about it. But that is because of the the scale of Google that pushes out and really again necessitate a lot of these deep tech innovation. And like Ray said, a lot of the consumer innovation, consumer tech innovation in China, whether it's the scale or the speed of which they release. Uh, their products, or the scale in which they have to handle concurrent users and customers, are necessitating infrastructure innovation on the enterprise tech side as well. That I think will become a larger and larger trend going forward. That's certainly something that I personally pay attention to very closely. And I think what necessitated Agora is really probably just the tip of the iceberg. As far as what else might be pushed out of the Chinese tech market, and I'm going to go into exactly what Agora's technology is right now. Some is to explain in the plainest term possible why Agora's core technology actually matters in terms of its、uh, usefulness. What the company provides is what is a software-defined networking solution, or SDN. And SDN is this, in my opinion, very revolutionary paradigm that first came out of Stanford's academia, and the goal was to separate what is called data plane and control plane. So, if we think about the internet, let's just say the first dot com bubble, or a little bit before that, the first iteration of the internet, the the way that the internet as a network is. Designed、uh, is what is called a best effort network, and that literally just means that it, the internet is going to try its best to deliver some data, whether it's a file or a text or audio or whatever you want to send to it, and it will just try its best, and it won't necessarily guarantee that it will get delivered 
or that even if it's, it is delivered, that the quality will be the same, that the data will not be corrupted along its way. And obviously that's not very good. And if any of you were alive and using Skype in the old days or any sort of these like audio video kind of interaction format, it really wasn't very good. And I think Tony, when he was building WebEx back in the days, felt a lot of the technical pain of that. And what's really impressive, I think, about the software-defined network way of thinking about the internet is that it, it, be, it was a way to separate the data, which is flowing through the pipes of the internet, all the fiber cables and whatnot that really sends the data back and forth, and the, the control of the flow of that data, which used to be all glued together and is now separated so that engineers can use software and algorithm to optimize and to improve the delivery of that data, whether that is audio, video, or whatever. And Aurora, in a nutshell, the technology is one of these SDNs, and it's designed to specifically optimize the delivery of just audio and video. And there are many other really good SDN based company. I think the first one is called Nicera, built by one of the, the founding academics of the software defined network paradigm. And there are a bunch of other companies that might do security or other sorts of optimization using SDN, but Agora is the one that is really focused on delivering audio and video. So that if we use Clubhouse, say I am at home right now with a pretty good Wi-Fi, but you might be, I don't know, jogging somewhere and using your 4G or your LTE, and all these kind of different networks can all patch into the same room, quote unquote, and have pretty much the same audio quality. So we can all enjoy this conversation facilitated by this kind of network. And that's in a nutshell what uh, Agora's core technology is. And one thing I also want to add, uh, which I did not write in my piece, but it's worth probably distinguishing, is that there's also this other thing called CDN, right? Content Delivery Network. And there are companies that also uh, focus on that, like Cloudflare, uh, Fastly, and pretty much every single cloud platform, AWS, Azure, uh, GCP, have their own CDN provider or CDN service. And I believe CDN is actually the layer above SDN, so people might conflate the two, but they're actually two different things. CDN being built on top of SDNs, and CDNs typically are used to store static data uh, and basically make caches or make different copies that you can put at different parts of the internet, literally at the edge, so that wherever you want to check your Instagram feed, whether you're traveling from Europe to Africa or the United States, it will load to pretty much the same thing in terms of speed, right? Which is very important for user experience. And so is if you were to watch Netflix, whether you're in Mexico, which is where I am right now, or somewhere in Japan, it will load in pretty much the same thing because CDN kind of distribute these static content uh, to around the internet to, sp to boost up the access speed. And obviously that doesn't really work if you're doing live streaming or live audio because you can't really store copies of what we're doing right now because we don't even have copies. We just started this room a few uh, minutes ago. So hopefully that gives everybody a pretty good understanding of the core tech of Agora uh, in a nutshell. The next thing I want to talk about is Agora's business model, which I find very interesting. I will call this the developer-friendly API model. So the way the company actually makes money is that, first of all, it gives every single account a free 10,000 minute per month, I think, like any random developer or any just person can just sign up for it and use it. And a fun personal anecdote, last year, it was like mid last year or something, when it, there was a real possibility that WeChat might get shut down in the US, I actually spent a couple of days, signed up for a developer account on Agora and played around with it and made a janky little video conferencing app 
so that in the case that maybe I can't use WeChat, I can send my mom this link and then she can still talk to me via video. So it worked decently well and I just used some free minutes that they give me. But obviously I did not end up having to use it because we can still use WeChat. But that was uh, kind of my personal taste of overall the product itself. And there are two hallmarks of this developer-friendly API model I think is worth noting. One is that it's pay as you use. So there's no need to have any upfront commitment to spending a lot of money and or time upfront before your app is actually used by people. And the more your app gets used, the more Agora will charge you for the usage, but it's pay as you go. And the other part, which I alluded to with my own experience, is that it is self-served for the most part. There's no salesperson really bothering you when you sign up for an account, when you're just hacking on an idea, when you just have an itch and you want to build something. And that's a super developer-friendly way to go to market because I'm pretty sure there are no engineers or developers out there who actually enjoy uh, talking to salespeople. No offense to my friends in the sales world. It's a very important function for any company. But the way Agora kind of presents itself to that audience is very self-serve and is also pay-as-you-use, which is very important and also very innovative in a lot of ways. I don't think there are that many companies that are yet applying this kind of go-to-market or business model in the public market. Twilio being one, Agora, and a few others and in terms of usage a base model, but there are many other companies in the private market doing that because it is, in my opinion, where the market is going as far as the consumption pattern or the consumption preference of developer-focused products like Agora and other, other kind of similar products. And the last thing I would note that I think is in beta from Agora right now is this thing called XLA, which I thought was like a clever spin or a clever idea, SLA. So SLA means service level agreement. And this is a very common agreement in cloud computing, in infrastructure technology and SaaS, where basically the provider guarantees you that the service will be available and up to a certain threshold. It's like a promise. And if the promise is broken, then the provider will have to, I don't know, give you some money back or give you credit or to compensate you for not being able to deliver on that promise. So every time if you read in the news uh, that AWS is down or GCP is down, chances are uh, some kind of SLA is broken and GCP or AWS or whoever you know had that problem will have to give some money back to their customers who suffered from it. And XLA is this newish thing that Aurora rolled out. And the X, I think, means experience, which is going back to the core tech discussion uh, because they did all this optimization to not only deliver audio and video data on time, but also to maintain some quality. The way they want to measure themselves is not just by delivery, but also by the quality of the delivery and to be able to guarantee their customers a level of experience and of course, if that isn't met, then they will have to compensate probably the customers as well in the same way the SLA does. But to me, the, their kind of confidence in rolling out something like this does speak to probably their technology being pretty good, even though this XLA thing is still in pilot phase. So that's something that's TBD for me as just like a armchair watcher of the company to see how XLA will shape up, how many people might take it up, whether it will actually hurt or help Agora the company, whether it will be an over-promise, under-deliver situation, or whether this will actually be able to help them earn more trust with their customers. So that's uh, my quick summary of the business model. Yeah, basically there are so many articles these days here in Silicon Valley about the next trillion dollar company or next trillion dollar opportunity is in developer-led companies or companies that sell to developers. That's right. And since you mentioned that, I might as well try to define developer as a term a little bit more tightly for everybody since we're talking about it, because I do think it gets thrown around quite a bit. But to me, a developer is really anyone who's using technology to solve a problem or to build something. So that obviously includes your 
classically trained CS students from a you know formal program, but it really also includes way more people than that. Whether it's people from boot camp or self-taught engineers building iOS apps or the latest using the latest framework to do this and that, they're using technology to build something or to solve certain problems. Uh, is how I think about the developer demographic. So it's really a huge and growing population. And I think one of the best metrics out there is、uh, GitHub, which is the largest developer collaboration platform or engineering collaboration platform out there. Put out an annual report, and their most recent 2020 report、uh, pegged their own number of developer at 56 million on GitHub's platform. And obviously, they are GitHub competitors as well. GitLab and Bitbucket and Gitty. And a few others, so it's definitely more than 56 million at this very moment. And GitHub's own projection is that they expect to have 100 million developers on their platform by 2025. So in five years, that population will essentially double. So that group of people, which I think will be very important to understand going forward. Will just drive the innovation、uh, around the world, really,、uh, because there are developers everywhere in the world. So that's it as far as Agora itself is concerned. Ray, do you want to share some thoughts on China's kind of like enterprise or SaaS market, and I can chime in as well before we, you know, go into Q and A. Hey Kevin, actually, remember in that one room we were in about China scale and China speed, you had actually mentioned these two examples of companies that are like Agora in the sense that they're a result of the successful platformization of Chinese internet companies, consumer internet companies that basically scaled up so much that they have now industry leading infrastructure technologies that are actually being spun off as individual companies. That's right. Yes, that's right. So I'll yeah, I'll yeah. quickly mention those two products that came out of China, which I think is very indicative again of the scale of Chinese tech companies pushing out lower level and lower level. I mean, like lower in the stack level in terms of infrastructure innovation, because there just actually isn't a good off the shelf solution anymore for them to handle the kind of traffic or interaction that they need to handle. And the first example is OceanBase, which is a large-scale distributed database that I believe first、uh, was R and D inside、uh, Ant Financial. So it was the database that was backing Alipay, the payment gateway of Ant. And as it matured, it also started becoming the backend service of pretty much everything that Alibaba does, including Singles Day. And you guys can probably all imagine if you heard of Singles Day or Shuang Shi Yi, the scale of that one day's shopping and the number of transactions, the orders, the money that has to go back and forth, the communication between that and the logistics side, and then the delivery. All that was is handled by OceanBase, which is incubated out of Alibaba. And based on certain industry benchmarks, is actually one of the highest performing distributed databases. Period. And I think it was last year, or maybe the year before, it actually left Alibaba and became its own separate database company. But I think Ant Financials or Ant Group is still a majority stakeholder of that product. Example number two is an open source distributed database called TiDB or TiDB, and you can Google that or search for that on GitHub. is one of the highest starred GitHub projects out there.、Uh, and quick disclaimer: I used to work for the company that commercializes and created TiDB. It's called Pincap. I was their general manager for their global strategy here in Silicon Valley. So I obviously know that technology intimately well as well, and the way or the trajectory in which that particular technology, which is open source, grew is because of the scale in which it battle tested itself in companies like Mobike, which was a high flying bike sharing platform for a few years when that was a thing, when that was a hot thing, and it's also deployed. In huge internet companies in Mei, like Meituan, Meituan Dianping, which is listed in、uh, Hong Kong, 
and a bunch of other companies like Zhihu and so on and so forth. And the reason why it's impressive is because they have to handle this database have to handle much more data uh, than a lot of the similar products that you will see in the U.S. For example, Zhihu has a lot more data actually compared to Quora, and the Meituan probably generates more data, quite frankly. Than a lot of the than DoorDash, for example. I don't know that for a fact, but just looking at the the variety of services that Meituan has to deliver for its users compared to something like a DoorDash or Instacart or whatnot, the scale is actually quite huge. And again, that goes back to our earlier core point、uh, that a lot of these scaled internet companies in China are pushing out really impressive innovation on the tech side, on, on the infrastructure tech side. Almost by necessity. I just have to say, I really like those two companies that you gave as examples, because I think when we talk about innovation as a society, we tend to have this attachment to fundamentally new technologies, things that are completely novel. But actually, in parallel, we should really realize that a lot of innovation is because of, like you said, scaling up. It's because certain things are being battle tested in reality. Just to give you guys an idea, Alipay's Absara operating system supported over half a million orders per second back in 2019, and even today, I think Visa's website says that they can only handle 65,000 transactions per second. So that's really an order of a magnitude difference, almost, and. There is actually an advantage for Chinese consumer internet companies because they are so big and so dominant, and they do generate so much more data and need to handle so many more concurrent users, for example, than many other ecosystems. So maybe the U.S. giants can still compete, but relatively speaking, China is probably one of the few really large markets where these companies are able to develop that. Really hardcore infrastructure technology, so it's personally no surprise to me because that's out of necessity. And I think there's always been this debate about, well, which is going to be the year that China Enterprise and SaaS really take off. And I think that when we talk about enterprise companies, there's cloud companies, there's actual SaaS companies, but now there's also this new crop or relatively new crop of developer-facing companies. And like you said, developers are broader than just coders. And now I'm starting to think that maybe you have the right idea, and it's this last group that's going to see the most success more quickly, because these developer companies are actually. Probably easier to internationalize, right? You don't have to depend on direct sales forces, and SaaS products are so dependent on how businesses actually operate, which can vary a lot from geography to geography. But if you're primarily just selling to other developers, you actually share a lot more in common in the tech stack than you do in your business operations stack. Hey, maybe it's easier to sell globally. What a great segue, Ray, to the Q and A session. <laughs> so, what one last point I will make on the enterprise market in China, and then we'll open up for Q and A, is interestingly coming back to Agora. I think it was only a couple of weeks ago. Agora bought a company called Easy Mob. The Chinese name is Huai, and it's basically an API, but for messaging, so for IMs. And it was interesting to me, and I want to bring this up to you guys because China's inter- enterprise market actually has been around for close to ten years now, and they're actually older companies, right? Kingsoft or Jinshan, which was like way back in the days, and it's actually going through almost a little bit of consolidation of its own. Obviously, there are more and more enterprise companies popping up, but but Agora bought、uh, Huanxin or Easy Mob recently as another indicator that the market there is. I think going through its cycles of maturation, and one thing to note is that enterprise companies always take a longer time to quote unquote succeed or make a ton of money compared to consumer tech companies. And obviously, just being consumer itself, it always has higher name recognition than enterprise tech companies. So these are companies that you may never ever heard of that might be powering something that you use. But I just thought that is also fascinating as the United States. Or Silicon Valley specifically is also going through 
its own boom of SaaS companies and cloud-based companies achieving incredibly high valuation in the public market and certainly seeing that in the private market as well.